postdoc in um, in Viterius Gallus Lab at Children's National Health System, Washington, DC. Uh, you can also find her on Twitter, and uh, the link will be in the chat. And you can find more about her work in, the, in her recent paper, and also this link you will find in the chat. Please, floor is yours. Thanks, Maria. So thank you for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, uh, for attending these talks. So today I'm going to be talking about endothelin-1 signaling uh, in the postnatal <clears throat> subventricular zone. So I'd like to begin uh, by first reminding everyone of the incredible cellular diversity of the central nervous system. And this diversity begins at a molecular level within individual cells, uh, which results in distinct functional properties. And this produces complex neural networks that ultimately allow us to interact with our environment. And what I find really interesting um, is that all of these different cell types arise from a single neural stem cell or progenitor cell type. And so neural stem cells are multipotent stem cells. They have the ability to self-renew as well as to generate both neuronal and glial lineages, including astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And neural stem cells are found in several uh, specialized regions of the CNS. And one of these stem cell niches is the subventricular zone or SVZ of the brain. So during embryonic development, you have radial glia or neural stem cells that give rise to neuronal progenitors or neuroblasts uh, dur during early embryonic stages. These radial glia will then give rise to oligodendrocyte progenitor cells uh, at late embryonic stages. And then following birth during early postnatal period, the SVZ continues to give rise to new neuronal and glial progenitors. And this continues to some extent also in the adult SVZ, just depending on the species. So in the adult SVZ, you still have st uh, neural stem cells, which are now called type B cells, and you will get some generation of new neurons and glial progenitors. And interestingly, a lot of work has shown that following insult to the CNS, such as in stroke, uh, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, or neurodegenerative disease, uh, these types of insults can induce uh, upregulation of neurogenesis and gliogenesis within the adult SVZ. So a lot of work has been done studying the signaling pathways that regulate adult neurogenesis, as well as this, uh, what regulates embryonic development. However, little work has been done looking at this early postnatal SVZ. And this early postnatal SVZ is a really interesting time point because it represents a transition from the highly proliferative uh, embryonic SVZ to the more quiescent adult SVZ. And it also represents a developmental window or period that is really susceptible to different types of injury that can happen uh, during uh, the perinatal period. So I'm specifically interested in figuring out what signaling pathways regulate this early postnatal SVZ, uh, focusing on these questions. So what signaling molecules regulate neural stem and progenitor cell differentiation? What promotes neuronal versus glial fate? And are these signaling molecules reactivated after injury or disease? And the significance of these questions is that we can hopefully identify signals that can lead to targeted treatments for promoting endogenous recovery in vivo as well as better in vitro cell cultures to model human development and disease. So the protein I'm gonna be focusing on today is endothelin-1. It's a small signaling peptide that binds to two receptors. Uh, today, I'm only gonna be talking about the B receptor, EDNRB. So endothelin-1 was primarily characterized as a potent vasoconstrictor. Um, however, it's been shown to also modulate development of cell types within the nervous system, especially glial cells. And it's also been shown to be upregulated by reactive astrocytes in multiple neurodegenerative diseases. So because of these facts, it appears that endothelin-1 might regulate both glial development as well as the glial response to injury. So I wondered whether endothelin-1 regulated signaling pathways in the uh, SVZ. So one of the first things I did was look at the expression of endothelin-1 and the receptors in the SVZ. And so I used immunohistochemistry to uh, look at different markers of the different cell types. So first I looked at markers for radial glia or the neural stem cells and found that radial glia are expressing both the endothelin ligand and the endothelin receptor. Oligodendrocyte progenitor cells or OPCs are expressing only the receptor. 
And then neuronal progenitor cells or NPCs are not expressing either the ligand or the receptor. So based on this profile, I would hypothesize that endothelin-1 is regulating glial development in the postnatal SVZ. So to answer this question, my first experiment was a loss of function experiment. So what I did was I used a nesting create ER mouse strain to specifically ablate expression of either endothelin-1 or the B receptor uh, within the early postnatal SVZ. And so I did this by giving mice uh, tamoxifen at P4 to induce recombination and knockdown. And then I analyzed the mice at P10. And the first thing I did was look at the neural stem cells or the radial glial cells using a marker BCAM1. And this is a whole mount staining looking at the apical surface of the SVZ, which is right adjacent to the lateral ventricles. And you can see here in the wild type mice that the neural stem cell processes are contacting the apical surface but you can see that this is reduced in both the endothelin-1 knockout and the B receptor knockout mice as well. And then to see whether this reduction had any, uh, was caused by any change in proliferation, I then uh, gave my BRDU at P8 and P9 before analysis at P10. And I looked to see what percentage of radial glia were proliferating at these ages. And I found that again, in the endothelin-1 knockout and the endothelin-B knockout mice, there was a reduction in the percentage of radial glia that were BRDU positive or were proliferating. So together, these results suggested that loss of endothelin-1 signaling in the SVZ reduces both radial glial number and proliferation. So this then led to the question of what are the effects of ablating endothelin-1 signaling on radial glial fate commitment? So to do this, I used the same experimental setup as before. However, I'm now uh, using also a ROSA YFP reporter strain. So this will label all of my recombined cells with YFP, and I'll be able to perform lineage tracing to see what these radial glial cells uh, give rise to. So first I looked uh, at a marker for radial glia, uh, BLBP. And again, I saw that in my knockout mice, there is reduction in the percentage of recombined cells that remained uh, radial glia. I then looked at a marker for ependymal cells, uh, S100 beta, and found that there was no significant change. I also looked at a marker for the oligodendrocyte lineage, olig2, and found there was also no si significant difference. Um, however, when I looked at a marker for neuronal progenitors, DCX, I found that there was a significant increase in both the endothelin-1 knockout and the B-receptor knockout mice. So this suggests that loss of the endothelin-1 receptor from the radial glia promotes uh, postnatal neurogenesis. And I also showed in other results that this increase in the neuronal progenitors in the SVZ does correlate with an increase in neurons in the olfactory bulb of these mice as well. So my last question was what downstream pathways are activated by endothelin-1 in radial glia to induce these cellular changes? So to answer this, I performed an in vitro um, culture system. So I dissected the SVZ from P10 wild type mouse pups, I dissociated the SVZ into single cells and formed neurospheres, added endothelin-1 and then performed RNA sequencing. And I found that there was roughly a thousand genes differentially expressed following endothelin-1 treatment. And looking at a subset of these genes, I found that there were several uh, stem and progenitor genes that were significantly upregulated following endothelin-1 treatment. Uh, this includes known stem cell markers like Nestin, BCAM1, Bimentin, and TNC. Uh, interestingly, I also found some uh, neurogenesis-related genes, such as ASCL1 and HES6, that were downregulated following endothelin-1 treatment. So again, this is suggesting that endothelin-1 is upregulating stem and progenitor genes and downregulating uh, differentiation or neurogenesis genes. In addition to these, I also found some uh, significantly changed genes in the notch pathway, and to follow up on that, I performed an additional experiment where I took neurospheres, added endothelin-1, and then performed qPCR at six hours later. And I found that even at six hours, there was significant uh, upregulation of JAGED1, NOTCH1, and HES5 uh, expression levels within the SVZ. And in addition, in my endothelin-1 knockout mouse, I found that after ablating endothelin-1 expression, 
and performing qPCR of the SVZ, there was a down regulation in jagged one, notch one, and HES5 expression in uh, these endothelin one knockout mice. So together, these results suggest that endothelin one activates notch signaling and radioglia to maintain their identity and prevent differentiation. So here's my model of endothelin one signaling. Endothelin one is secreted by radial glia. It binds to the receptor on the radial glia in an autocrine manner to activate notch signaling, uh, prevent differentiation and promote proliferation and maintenance. Um, and another part of my story, which I don't have time to talk about, I also found that endothelin one directly signals to uh, the receptor on oligodendrocyte progenitor cells to promote their proliferation and prevent their maturation into oligodendrocytes. So following this developmental work, I then wanted to see whether endothelin one was reactivated in the adult SVZ following injury or disease. And the injury I focused on was demyelination. So demyelination occurs in a large variety of insults and neurodegenerative diseases, uh, such as multiple sclerosis. And it's been shown previously in both, uh, especially in mouse models of demyelination, that the SVZ does respond to demyelination. It increases proliferation and increases production of OPCs that will migrate from the SVZ to uh, demyelinated lesions, where it will contribute to remyelination. And this has also been shown in multiple sclerosis patients, uh, where you see an increase in SVZ proliferation. So my question was whether endothelin one promotes neural stem cell proliferation in the adult SVZ after demyelination. And to answer this, I used a lysolethacine model of demyelination. So you inject uh, LPC or lysolethacine into the subcortical white matter. And this, is, this induces a focal demyelination shown here uh, in a region that is close to the SVZ. And then you also uh, perform saline or control injections into the contralateral side. So to see whether endothelin one uh, regulated this response to demyelination, I used my same endothelin one knockout mice. Um, I administered tamoxifen and then induced demyelination at day zero and then analyzed the mice at day seven. And first I looked at um, the proliferation of these neural stem cells, which I'm using GFAP and SOX2 to label these neural stem cells. And in well-type mice, you see that following LPC or demyelination, you get a significant increase in proliferation of these cell types, but in the endothelin one knockout mice, you lose this, this increase in proliferation. So this suggests that loss of endothelin one reduces neural stem cell proliferation in the SVZ following demyelination. So to conclude, I've shown you today that in the developing postnatal SVZ, radial glia secrete endothelin one, uh, which regulates back to radial glia to promote their maintenance and proliferation. Endothelin one also regulates oligodendrocyte progenitor cells in the SVZ. And in the adult SVZ after demyelination, we're seeing a similar uh, thing happening and that endothelin one is upregulated and appears to be regulating proliferation of these adult neural stem cells or type B cells. And I'm currently investigating whether this is occurring uh, also via the B receptor and whether it's also playing a role on the oligodendrocyte response to demyelination as well. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, all the members of the Gallo Lab, especially my mentor, Vittorio Gallo, for all of his support. Um, all of my collaborators that helped uh, with working on this project and then as also my funding source. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for this, uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, so it's amazing work. And if you have questions, please, uh, panelists, attendees, go ahead. Because I would have an AU1, you mentioned that um, uh, there's some implication with uh, multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on that? What would be the strategy to maybe go for the translational step or? Yeah, sure. So in multiple sclerosis, um, you have, at least in the SVZ, it's known that there's an increased proliferation of cell types within the SVZ. It's still not sure whether um, you get migration of new oligodendrocyte progenitor cells to the lesions where they will repair those lesions. Um, but at least in mouse models, that has been shown. Um, so there's a couple of different therapeutic 
approaches you could take. Um, so specifically with the SVZ, you would wanna promote the proliferation um, of these OPCs and their migration to the demyelinated lesions. A uh, second aspect that I didn't have time to talk about is that uh, within the lesion itself, um, there's signaling proteins that are known to kind of block the maturation of oligodendrocyte progenitor cells to the mature cells that actually make the myelin. Um, and endothelin-1 previously in our lab we showed plays a role in that too. So I think for multiple sclerosis, endothelin-1 is actually playing like a dual role it's promoting um, a proliferate, a pro like a progenitor state proliferation response, um, but it's also preventing uh, maturation. So it's a little bit complicated when you start thinking about the actual therapy and how you would address mm -hmm. that. Um, I think it would involve probably very targeted uh, treatments uh, depending on the region of the brain and the time and everything. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so this is an amazing session. Thank you again, uh, Laura, Jennifer, and Katerina for, for your wonderful talks. And I just wish you the best of the day that you have and with your future endeavors in science. And I guess we can close the session. We're just right on time. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, Maria. Hi, thank you so much.